The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, I came to cast out fire upon the earth and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with and how I am constrained until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on it? No, I tell you, but rather division. For henceforth, in one house, there will be five divided against, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against her mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The Gospel of the Lord. Question number one. What is the one theme that runs through all of today's readings? Question two. Identify that sentence in our second reading from Hebrews chapter two. Identify that sentence which urges us to embrace deferred gratification rather than the instant gratification that my people are always embracing. There is a sentence in the second reading that urges us to embrace deferred gratification. What is that sentence? Question three. Jesus says, I have come to bring fire on it. What kind of fire has Jesus brought to the world? And how do we reconcile the fact that Jesus is the Prince of Peace how do we reconcile Jesus, the Prince of Peace, with Jesus who brings fire and division? He makes it clear today. I have brought fire. I have brought division between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, father and son, and so on. How do we reconcile the Prince of Peace with the one that brings division? Question four. Standing for something often means standing against many things. Standing for something often means standing against many things. How does this statement challenge us, Nigerian Christians of today? Yes, um, precious. Good morning, Father. Good morning. I'd like to answer question four. Yes. This statement challenges me because I have to lose a friend of mine who is not who is not leading me to where I want to be in my Christian faith and pursuit. It's not helping you. It's not helping me. So standing for my Christian pursuit, I have to let this friend go. And it hurts me and hurts some people around me too. I think ah. that's what the statement means today. Do you have a Jesus. broken relationship? <laughs> Something you, like that, Father. You lost a boyfriend? <laughs> 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 and how long was this relationship? <laughs> yeah, please hold her. Hold her hand and console her. <laughs> yes, Barista. Question number two. Uh, I hope I'm right. I think the one sentence that uh, urges us to embrace the fat gratification is the part where it says, for the sake of the joy that lies ahead, he embraced the cross, despising each shame. Okay, it's only the grammar you didn't get right. Yes, I know the content. Yeah, I for the sake the of the joy that lay ahead, yes. he embraced, embraced the cross. The cross. That, is, that is Jesus, right? Yes, yes. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Chibike now. 
morning, Father. Good morning. I want to answer question four. Yes. It means that we will face many challenges in our life and we should be ready. Challenges like You do face, you know what challenges are? Yes. Like, People are knowing what challenges are too early these days. <laughs> okay, tell us about challenges. Like in your like in your class, your your teacher is saying the wrong thing. Uh -huh. you, you correct him. Hey, uh, my children are beginning to correct teachers, right? The teacher is saying the wrong thing. Wrong thing like what? What does what are the wrong things your teachers say you correct? My own teacher, he says there are nine commandments, not ten. Your teacher has removed one commandment from the ten. And of course, you have to correct, correct the teacher. And the one commandment that he removed was the first one. He removed the first one. And he says there are nine. Of course, I, I, even before you say it, I know you will correct the teacher. Yes. So, I told him that it was not ni nine, that it was ten. So, yes. he flogged me. He flogged you. <laughs> and it's part of the suffering of Jesus. Of being a Christian. You will receive how many strokes? Like five or four. Oh, St. Paul received 39 many times. If it is only four or five, you got it. It's okay. It's okay. Give him a round of applause. Yes, give him the microphone. My name is Ikechuku, and I will attempt question one. Ikechuku, Father. you're welcome. Thank you. I, I feel, I strongly believe that the theme that runs across all of the readings this morning is the assurance of turbulence, persecution, in our race to heaven. Oh, that's not very good news now. Why don't you say it more, let it be more palatable. Assurance of turbulence. You're not saying assurance of blessings. You are saying assurance of turbulence. Where do you, where do you come from? <laughs> These my people, they don't want to hear assurance of turbulence. They want to hear assurance of abundance. Okay. I believe I came from the wrong uh, perspective. I, what I was trying to say in essence is that Oh, okay, you want to correct yourself <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's listen to him yeah? That in our day-to-day -day Christian lives yes. There must be problems, alienations, troubles But that we must always look at the ultimate goal as we plow along I think you need to come and do the preaching you, uh, <laughs> Give him a round of applause Now, you remember I used to say that for the children of God, trials are not a probability, they are a certainty. Remember? For God's children, for those who will live the life of God, the life of holiness, trials are not a probability, they are a certainty. Okay. Now, let's look at those who went through trials now. Prophet as a troublemaker. The prophet as what? If you are not making trouble in your office, you are not making trouble at home, you are not making trouble anywhere, check your Christian life, whether you are really living it. Especially when you are living in a rotten society like this. You know I keep saying that the only thing that makes progress in the latrine is what? It's maggot. Maggot is the thing that makes progress. If you are comfortable in our environment, in our rotten, unjust environment, violent, hateful, resentful, of ethnic bigotry, religious intolerance, economic injustice, if you are very comfortable and check it, you are deep inside the latrine. If you have everything is okay, if you are really a prophet of God, and all of us who are baptized are prophets by virtue of our baptism. Then you will be some form of troublemaker. Now, Jeremiah loved his people very dearly. Jeremiah didn't hate his people. But he loved God and the truth even more. Every believer loves his people. 
In the course of history, every prophetic person loved his people. It's not as if he hated his people, but he loved the truth more. Because, you see, our faith, our Judeo-Christian faith tells us that there are value scales. There is a hierarchy of values. Hierarchy of values. And the highest in the scale of values is not physical human life. The highest in the scale of values is not my community, my family, good or bad. My family. Oh, my family. No. The highest in the scale of values is God. Truth, love, truth, justice. They are higher than human life. Do you know that? So, rather than compromise truth, human beings, the best of human beings have given up their lives rather than compromise truth. Meaning, if it comes to compromising truth, then let me die. But I'll not tell a lie. The Christian religion commends such people. They are not fools. They are people who recognize that the physical human life has only a relative value. And it is relative to higher values like truth, justice, purity, chastity, and so on and so forth. Love. At a time of moral decay and political turmoil, Jeremiah predicted an oncoming catastrophe. What human beings always want to hear is that there shall be showers of blessing. Yeah. That is what people want to hear. It is well. It is well. Ah, she be our God is on the throne. Everything is well. Jeremiah says it is not well. Because you have not been living well. And uh, as they, I was telling the young people who were on, on, on retreat or workshop here, as you lo- lay your bed, so you lie on it. So if you lay your bed in such a way that it won't be well, it won't be well. After laying a crooked bed, then you say it shall be well, you will wake up with backache and neck pain. Do you understand? And all the prophet is telling you is that the way you have laid your bed, you are going to wake up with backache. That's all the prophet is saying. But what do people want to hear? It is well. It will be well. Everything will be okay. You will get your millions. I mean, it's like the Nigerian society today. We ended up that there was practically no productivity anymore in this country. Car assembling plants that we had, Volkswagen, to, uh, um, Big Pijo, and so on, they all disappeared. Uh, textile um, industries that we had, we had in Kano, in Kaduna, all over, the, about all over the place, they all disappeared. We began to import everything down to toothpick. Everything. Then, in fact, some of us rich people began to even import custom design champagne. Uh-huh. I ha- we have I've been to some marriages, marriage occasions, and we were served champagne with the image of the couple engraved on it. And I don't know if you heard that Nigeria was, f- champagne is a product of France, right? But Nigerians were among the highest consumers of champagne. And some of those champagnes cost hundreds of thousands for a bottle. Yes. Now, we we descended to this level of stupidity and idiocy. And then the pastors are telling us it is well. It is not well. Because the way the global economy is arranged, if you don't produce, you are living a fake economy. If you don't produce, if you are only consuming. And we were consuming all that with oil money. Now, oil money is gone. So immediately, what you are going to see immediately, so this is the problem. The prophet will tell you, the way you are consuming and not producing, you are going to experience a recession. They will say, hey, shut up, shut up. Bad mouth. Prophet as troublemaker. Now, he warned that the people will soon be defeated and humiliated by their enemies if they do not. The people didn't repent, but they said, don't tell us this. He accused uh, 
these, the false prophets of appealing to popular sentiments, just as it is happening today, right? A lot of prophets and preachers and pastors are appealing to popular sentiment. Popular sentiment is that you are poor today, barista, you will be a millionaire by the end of the year. <laughs> And I keep saying, it is a rogue society where no work is going on and people will be millionaire at the end of the day. It's a rogue society. It is not sustainable. And our young people are growing up with that idea that you can be a millionaire without doing anything. And the prophet has to say, no, it doesn't work that way. All the leaders of the society were enriched at the, at the prophecy of uh, Jeremiah. The king was enriched. The princes were enriched. The army was enriched. The hired prophets and the false prophets were enriched. The political and economic elite were enriched. Even the religious authorities were enriched. They were fed up with Jeremiah's message of doom and gloom. They were determined to get rid of him. So, first of all, they threw him into prison. As they put him in Kujé prison, the guy continued to harass the soldiers and the, the prison warders that are there with his message. So they got tired of him and took, took him to a well. And the well was full of mud, 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 very muddy well. And he was there sinking into the place with no food until an Ethiopian friend of the king, eh? An Ethiopian friend of the king went and told him that what you people have done is very wicked. Oh. This man didn't do anything deserving this kind of dying of hunger inside a muddy pit. Then the king asked them to release him. Jeremiah did not do violence to anyone, did he? But because he stood for godly values, those who were comfortable with the status quo always saw him as a dangerous fellow. And the majority of people always are comfortable with the status quo. He so irritated the people that they got rid of him. Thus, he paid the price of truth with his life. Jesus says in today's gospel, I came to cast fire on it and how I wish it were already kindled. How I wish the fire were already blazing. Again, he says, do you think I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. For from now on, father against son, son against father, daughter against mother, mother against daughter, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. This appears to contradict all we know of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 introduces Jesus as the eternal father. The wonderful one, the prince of peace. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, he says, and look at, take a look of this. Blessed are the peacemakers. In John chapter 14, verse 27, he says, he promises his disciples the peace which the world cannot give. So, what fire has Jesus come to kindle? Is it the fire of Chibuike that will burn all our enemies. It is the fire of the Holy Spirit Jesus is referring to. Which fire now? The fire that cleanses and purifies. Two, the fire of God's presence as in the burning bush with Moses. Next, as in the Exodus pillar of fire. You remember? Which, is, which, is, which was the evidence of God's presence among his journeying people. Next, as in the Pentecost tongues of fire. Next, the fire of God's love that sets aflame the hearts of the faithful. How do we say it? Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. The fire that sets the hearts of believers in flame, in flame so that they will have the courage, they will have the commitment, they will have the dedication, they will be able to live the life of God. It is the fire that fuels. 
It is the fire that fuels the believer, that gives the believer passion. You know, I do define passion as fire within that burns relentlessly despite every attempt of others to put it off. What is the cause of that fire? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit puts that fire in the person. The message of Christ is clearly non-violent. Jesus doesn't cause violence. His message promotes love and forgiveness and compassion and harmony and unity and peace. But the message of Jesus Christ also challenges those guilty of idolatry in all its forms. And today we have idolatry in many forms, don't we? We have idolatry in many forms. There are people today that their celebrity is their God. Their celebrity. And, and all forms of worship goes towards their celebrity, not to the God of Jesus Christ. They claim to be Christians, but the person that takes their heart, that possesses their heart, that sets fire on them is their celebrity. So whatever it is, as you reflect, sit down and you reflect, whatever it is that is number one in your life in terms of engaging you at the depth of your being, that is your God, whether you realize it or not. Next, social injustice in all its forms. Next, discrimination in, of all kinds, corruption and dishonesty, the arrogance of power, ethnic and racial bigotry, the abuse of human rights and dignity, the insensitivity of the rich towards the poor, those who live as if life has no purpose beyond here and now. Because there are these problems, then there will be division. Those who hold the values of Christ will necessarily be in conflict with people who live along these parameters. Do you understand? Can we read this together? The message of Jesus often does not have exactly the same impact on the poor and the rich. The message of Jesus comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. Again. Let's read the whole thing together. The message of Jesus often does not have exactly the same impact on the poor and the rich. So, the poor people and the rich people, they listen to the same message. But they don't go home the same, with the same feeling, do they? If it is well preached, if that message is really well preached, one goes home comforted, the other goes home afflicted. Especially when you are living in a highly unjust society where the poor, as Amos says, are being sold for a pair of sandals. In such a society, if the gospel of Jesus is well preached, the poor who come and hear the gospel should go home feeling a little better and the rich should go home crying. Because to whom much has been given? I don't know if any of you saw the uh, interview I granted or uh, discussion I had with uh, one of our principals, principal of one of our secondary schools uh, that, was, that was on TV about the fact that we have schools. Went to the school and the, the, in, the principal introduced the fact that, you know, we have uh, this wonderful compound here and then the students are well fed and then they eat six times a day. Yeah, they have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then they have um, tea break in the morning, and then after siesta, they have what they call uh, cap, what is it? They call it cap up or something. Then uh, for night, after dinner, na after night prep, there is something again, six times a day. So, and I went and I said, oh, this is nice, and so on, so on, oh, the wonderful compound. Uh, how, many, how many teachers live on this compound? You say, oh, about 75 teachers live on the school compound. I said, this is really nice. Must cost some money. Oh, it doesn't cost too much. That's about 250, 300,000. It doesn't cost too much. I said, I said, the school in my village, um, sometimes 
Their school fees is not up to 10,000 naira, and many parents cannot pay. I said, so do you recognize that we have a highly segregated society? In most civilized societies, elementary school and high school is paid for by government equally for everybody. So everybody gets an equal head start. Everybody gets a level playing ground to begin with. Then you now start isolating according to the interests and talents of the, school, of the children to different institutions. And that is what it was meant to be when we had the 6334 starting, meaning every child was supposed to have equal opportunity until GSS 3. And government is supposed to pay for it so that everybody has so that you have the same standard what has happened is that those whom god has blessed in this society who have the responsibility to help fund education fund health care what we have done is to take our children and put them in early schools where they eat six meals a day yes and destroy the children of the poor. Literally destroy the children of the poor. And I said in that interview, and I repeat, and I always say it here, we shall pay for it. We shall pay for this crime. This is a crime. Because everybody in the elite group, everybody in the economic and political elite, there is something we can do and let no one here tell me that oh, I'm not minister of education. I'm not president. I'm not governor. Every one of us, there is something we can do. There is a little you can do. You can help the school in your village. In your father's village. You can promote it. There is something each one of us can do. You can give scholarship to one or two children along with your children. How do you spend one million naira on your child, one child in a year, and you don't bother that there are children that 30,000 naira is not available to be spent for them in that whole year. You are comfortable with that? That's okay, right? Well, once we do that, we should be prepared to ship all our children overseas. Because if they are going to come here, here will not be comfortable enough for those children. And it is not a cause. Is it a cause? It's the order of nature. That's how things work. Meaning, as Jesus says, to whom much has been given from him, much is expected. And I say that many of those who have ended up organizing our society like this, they are those who went to primary, secondary schools and universities on scholarship. They went overseas to Cambridge, to University of London, they went to Oxford on scholarship. And they came and are superintending a system where 90% of the children are running around the streets unable to go to school. This sin will cry to heaven. This sin will cry to heaven. Vested interests in society including beneficiaries of a corrupt status quo. Because what we are talking about now is a corrupt status quo. Beneficiaries of a corrupt status quo, those devoted to wealth and power, will do anything to keep the status quo, will stoutly resist any change. Some people are going to hear this message, they watch this tonight, and they will call me tomorrow, blasting me about how uh, I am being unrealistic. It doesn't work. There is no society where everybody is equal. Like... GBK, I will take those lashes because second reading of today said we have not had to shed our blood. Though the gospel bearer, the prophet, does not desire to bring about conflict, conflict does what? Inevitably result when anyone strives to fearlessly preach and courageously live out the values of the gospel in a corrupt, promiscuous, exploitative, and godless society. I don't wake up any day. None of us, who, anybody who is preaching the gospel does not wake up and say, I am going to cause trouble today. Is that how it works? 
No, you don't wake up to say, I'm going to cause trouble. I wake up and pray for peace. But as you live your life and as you pass on the message, you will be confronted with crisis, conflicts. In defending truth, justice, human dignity, and freedom, the Christian message will inevitably meet with opposition within families and in the wider society. And the biggest problem I see is that people are not even ready to confront within the families and in the wider society. People are taking these things as if it is normal. And I'm saying, hmm, when everybody is mad, where is sanity? How can a situation be like this and people are waking up, dressing up, making up, and carrying on as if everything is normal? No. There needs to be more process on the streets. There needs to be more process everywhere. Things are not normal. This is not how a society should be organized. And I am not only blaming the people who are occupying power, but every one of us who sees this mess, and all we want to do is that we want to join them. Is that not the orientation in this society? To join them, just to join them, to join the people who are quote-unquote successful. Level has changed. Level has changed. And when your level changes, you forget the people who are with you at the level below. You forget. That's what happens. Keep telling you about how, when I was in Lagos, um, people used to come. Uh, 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 it's a teacher in the village. I, I, I read economics. I read this. I read this. I'm a teacher in the village. They are giving me 15,000 or 12,000. And then come to Lagos. Then get the person a job. From 12,000, the person is earning 60,000. What does the person do? Level has changed. Forgets the people she left in the village and joins the 60,000 people. Then, no do, no do. He gets a job with Zenith. And he, salary shoots within two years. Salary shoots from 12000 to 300000 What does she do? Support the people in the village? No way. It is then she will discover that people of my level, they go on holidays. They go, they go on holidays. And, and um, even the money she's earning is not enough for her new taste. From bend down shoe of 1,500 naira in the village, she is now ordering 60,000 naira shoes. Yes, that is my level. It's my new level. Idiot. <laughs> On account of preaching the undiluted truth, the faithful Christian will be isolated and persecuted discredited and maligned, abused and calumniated, mocked and derided. After saying, blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus also says, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of the gospel. Can you link the two? In the same vein, with the same mouth, at the same time that he said, blessed are the peacemakers, in Matthew chapter 5 verse 9, what did he say? Blessed are those who are persecuted for... Aha. Uh -huh. They go together. So you are making peace. You are working for peace. But you are a target of persecution. Jesus was meek and humble of heart. He was gentle. But when denouncing evil and proclaiming the truth, he was always firm. He didn't put water in the mouth. When it came to denouncing evil and proclaiming the truth, he was firm, decisive, and uncompromising. He didn't mind words. Can we read that? The message of Jesus was not always palatable. His preaching was not always crowd-friendly. He didn't preach prosperity and abundance. I mean, what you see these days is that people flock to where everybody is going. So we even have around here now, we have the trendy church. Okay, this is the church that is trendy. This is the church that is trendy. Often, people go to where they want to hear what they want to hear. Is that the orientation of the gospel? I keep saying, if you go to church and you go home and nothing is pricking you about what area of your life you need to address to deal with. Nothing. 
then that worship session is not complete. Because you cannot enter the presence of God and not realize what a sinner you are. I mean, look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 10. Jeremiah chapter 1, and so on. When all those people enter the presence of God, immediately you say, oh, I am a sinner, a horrible sinner, a person and unclean lips from among a people of unclean lips. What am I doing here? Why am I in the presence of God? But today, people are going to church, and in the presence of, uh, of God, in the presence of God, in the church, they are doing this. Uh, um, um, uh, I am. Uh, what adjective do I use? Okay, let me leave them. Because, you see, what, for, to me, what it means is that they don't even recognize where they are. In whose presence they are. Next, listening to Jesus was not always a sweet experience. With some sugar-coated message. No. Listening to Jesus is not always sweet. I mean, people listen to Jesus. And after listening to Jesus, halfway through, they are picking their stones to stone him. Or, if they won't stone him, they are walking away one by one. You remember chapter 6 of the Gospel of St. John? Walking away. To the extent that Jesus Christ turned after talking about the bread of life, turned and saw only 12 of them. And he had to ask. Did he tell them, please, I beg, don't go away. Is that what he told them? He turned to them and said, you uncle, won't you go away too? Jesus was not a crowd puller. The genuine preacher of the gospel is not a crowd puller. Crowds don't embrace the truth. When you see big crowds, watch it. Perhaps the truth is not well, being well preached. Because crowds don't embrace the truth. This is not only about Christianity. In any religion, throughout the course of history, crowds don't embrace the truth. It is the minority that embrace the truth. You remember that even Peter, the head of the apostles, when Jesus was walking towards Jerusalem and he called them, and he told them after leaving Caesarea Philippi, when Peter had said, you are the Christ, son of the living God, Jesus began to talk about how he is going to suffer and die at the hands of sinners. What did Peter do? Peter held him and began to remonstrate with him, hold him, no, no, you are not going, you are not going. Did did Jesus say, well, since you are sad about this now, uh, what did man go do? In order, in order not to make you sad, let me change my mind. Is that what he did? Jesus was firm. Jesus was firm and decisive and uncompromising where he said, get behind me, Satan. That was harsh, isn't it? He called Peter Satan. That was harsh. So, listening to Jesus was not always a sweet experience. He did not seek to make himself popular with some sugar-coated message. No way. Again, Jesus says, whoever is not for me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Be, be, be sure where you are. Are you for Jesus or against Jesus? If you choose to be for Jesus, there is a cost. C-O-S-T. There is a price. P-R-I-C-E. Jesus chose to disturb people because they needed to be disturbed. What did I say? In the area of my life, that I am not doing well. In the area of my life. That I have refused to cooperate with the grace of God. So as to make the leap. To the holiness God has called me to. I will be disturbed. Because I deserve to be disturbed. If you go to church. And you have some hidden corners of your life. And those corners of your life are not disturbed. And you go home. Something is wrong. Every time you go to church. Every time you even kneel in your house. It is not surprising. That the, as you go deeper and deeper into sin. That you are not able to pray. 
Now, people who are not able to pray, they go deeper into sin. They are even better off. But the ones who jump out of fornication and are casting and binding, it shows they don't know. They don't know what prayer is. Because if it is indeed prayer, you can't, you can't be living a life of sin, active life of sin, and then you think that you can walk into God's presence and walk out like that. If you do, you crawl there on your face in shame. Not so. What Jesus taught often shocked some people and infuriated others. What Jesus taught brought him in conflict with the religious elite, the political elite, and the economic elite. He called the scribes and the Pharisees what? The way I used to say, idiot. Eh? <laughs> okay. He called some people blind guides, hypocrites, whitewashed sepulchre. Those were not palatable, were they? Jesus' justice brought him in conflict with those who exploited the poor and the weak. Jesus has demonstrated to us that the poor and the weak are his special friends. As you did it to the list of my brethren, you did it to me. So, those of us who exploit the poor and the rich, Jesus cannot be happy with us now. Jesus' integrity brought him in conflict with the dishonest and corrupt people. Jesus' tolerance brought him in conflict with the narrow-minded racial and ethnic bigots. I told you last Sunday or the Sunday before that anyone who really embraces the gospel and who is growing in the, in the spiritual life cannot be tied down to his clan or his tribe. If you are still so tied down to your clan and to your tribe, and your passion comes when they talk about your clan or your tribe, you are nowhere near what we are talking about, the Christian life we are talking about. Because, as St. Paul says, it is for freedom that set us free. I say to people, the poor people in Damaturu and the poor people of Obubura, they are equally oppressed in this country. And all of us who belong to the elite, we should be concerned about the exploited and poor people of Ishekiri land, as much as Tiv land, as much as Yoruba land. I believe I have been liberated from that type of ethnic bigotry. I know. Latifa, you go to the north to do work. You see poor people there, don't you? And they, some of them are even poorer than the ones in your village. So those who open their eyes in this country will discover that all of us in the elite are equally guilty and must do something for the poor of this country. Jesus stirred up so much hatred that he ended up being crucified. The crucifixion was just the end result. You know, in the school you do cumulative, what do you say? Eh? Continuous assessment. Uh -huh. So at the, end of the at the end of the session, when they give you your result, that is not the beginning, isn't it? It is cumulative. It is said that the brighter the light, the darker the shadow it casts. Again, the brighter the light, the darker the shadow it casts. Jesus ended up the way he did because he was a prophet. Prophets are always persona non grata. If you are light, you see, the reason why prophets, prophetic people do suffer like that is because if you are light eh, in a dark environment, the brighter you are, the more shadow you cast. You know, if everywhere were bright light, will there be shadow? There won't be shadow. But because the environment is dark, 
And there's not sufficient light. So when light is plenty in one direction, it casts shadow in the other direction. Fire warms. The gospel is a force for transformation. If you and I hear the gospel or read the gospel every day, then we should be, in, in, uh, we should be experiencing transformation because the gospel is a force for transformation. Fire warms and comforts. But also, fire burns up what is useless and refines what is impure. The gospel of Christ is fire that burns up what is useless and purifies what is impure. That is what the gospel is supposed to do in each one of us. The gospel is the most potent agent of transformation. The problem I have, and I have written a lot about it, some of you have read my book, The Prophetic Church. I have written a lot about the fact that the gospel, there is no more powerful force than the gospel of Christ to change society. There's no force that is more powerful than the gospel of Christ to change society. How can we say we are Christians in our millions and our society is like this? It means we have not embraced the gospel. It's clear to me. It's clear to me that all this noise making all over the place is pure noise making. I'm saying, sure you say you are Christians. You say you are Christians. Where is the transformation in your life? Where is the transformation in your environment? Don't tell me you are Christians with mouth, which is what we are doing. Prophets and true bearers of the gospel are troublemakers in the best sense. There is no greater disturber of peace than the one who preaches justice and truth. I mean, in the midst of all the ethnic bigotry in our society and all the mediocrity, when occasionally somebody writes something, let's say on Facebook, they attack, I'll be iffy, the attack the person will get. Immediately, Abu, insult. The attack you will get. If you say, hey, let's take these things easy. Let's be more objective in the way we take this thing. In one, in, in 30 minutes, you may get a hundred reactions and it's insults. Because what people often call peace is no peace at all. You see, the prophet disturbs the fake peace that the people want to have. The prophet challenges people to desire real peace and to seek peace. Because often, what people have is what is called the peace of the graveyard. Any peace that is not based on justice, any peace that is not based on equity, any peace that is not based on human dignity, any peace that is not based on proper organization of society with the common good as the priority, such peace is a piece of the graveyard, such as we had during the military. During the military, we had peace, but it was one kind of peace. It was the peace of the graveyard because there was a gun behind our head to say we should behave. A lot of what is considered normal today are an affront on the gospel of Christ and the values of the kingdom. The widespread indiscipline in our society is an affront on the gospel. The corruption in all sectors of our society is an affront. The level of deceit and falsehood is an affront. The degree of violence is an affront. The ethnic bigotry is an affront on the gospel and the values of the kingdom. The epidemic of greed and avarice, the preponderance of fornication and adultery. And people are committing fornication and adultery as if it has been removed from the gospel. Uh, it's no longer part of the, uh, the, the, the gospel of Christ. The abuse of power and privilege. The refusal to love, to forgive, and to show mercy. The scandalous gap between the rich and the poor. These are not normal for the children of God. These are not normal. I, I, I keep saying that work hard. Work hard and I don't, I'm not saying everybody should be destitute. But please recognize that those of us who are living in this other part of town, not those of them who are living in um, uh, beyond Warman Village, 
Those of us who are living this part of let us know that it is a privilege. It is a privilege and that while living in Villanova Estate, I should be daily engaged in what can I do to improve the lot of those other guys in all the slum settlements around it. What can I do? I have more prerogative to do something. God did not give me my brains only to make money for myself. In case that is what many people think. God did not give me my brains only to make money for myself. He gave me those brains to see how I can improve the lot of the others. So I help myself and help the others. Otherwise, as I am eating alone, it is going to constipate me. We were never meant to use our resources only for ourselves. No. There is a tendency today to take the fire out of the gospel of Christ. To talk about the gospel of Christ but without fire. It's a tendency to take the fire out of it. You know, just like a desica, wishy-washy. No, no content, no, no, no passion. I, I, you know, I keep saying this, giving this example. I say, when I see how many, Christ, how, many, how many of our Christians live the Christian life in a very tepid, tepid, you know what tepid means? Eh? If you carry a camo, and a camo done a day for fridge, if you put a camo inside fridge overnight, the next morning, look at the camo. It looks tepid. That is how many people live the Christian life. But those same people, I watch them watching football and I see fire. The gospel of Christ is supposed to have that kind of fire and more. And I don't see it in the life of many people. To read the gospel of its transforming influence. Many people have the tendency to reduce the message of Christ to some feel-good experience such as we witness at many noise-making, uh, noisy church services. Just feel good experience. People go to church to dance, and they say, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Who told you that going to church is to, to, is to come out? It was wonderful. Wonderful feeling. Not wonderful uh, experience with the divine, but wonderful sensual feeling. Just, just titillate the senses. Titivate the senses. You just, you just tickle the senses. You know the way we used to play as children. The, you go to the back of the person and you, you use your finger to... Eh? You, you, you use your finger to tickle then the person would... <laughs> 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 That's all people are looking for in churches now. That's all people are looking for. They want to be, they want to be tickled. Constantly tickled. And you know what it does? You refuse to think, to use your brains to reflect. All, in fact, it has reached such an extent that churches are now importing comedians to, to come and, since the pastor is not such a wonderful comedian, they invite comedians to come and help their people laugh. Since their people want to laugh endlessly, and as they are laughing, then they are reaching for their purses and are contributing, and the pastor is smiling to the bank. Is that what churches are made for? Well, some of them make a mistake. They bring comedian who comes and uses the pastor. It is the pastor he uses to... <laughs> when this happens, the living will lose its power. Jesus Christ says, when salt loses its taste, the light will grow dim. Again, can we say what we have read before? Standing for Jesus means standing against many things that run counter to the values of the gospel. Genuine loyalty to Christ's teaching is sure to rock the boat, causing division and conflict in the family, at work, in the society, as every committed Christian already knows. Even Chibike has already begun to... You receive how many strokes of the cane? 
four or five strokes of the cane, you will receive more. Uh, so just get ready. If there is a, if there is some cream to toughen, to toughen your your palm, they, they take it so that when more strokes of the cane, you just. At baptism, we were anointed priests, prophets, and kings. We have often shied away from our prophetic mission, which is to live out and proclaim God's undiluted message, like Jeremiah and Jesus Christ. And the cloud of witnesses through history, we are challenged today to make a choice. What is the choice? To stand for or against Jesus. By standing for Jesus means more than the noisy, very noisy, but superficial enterprise that many of us call Christianity. Standing up for Jesus requires the grace of courage. One, courage to speak and live out the truth in an environment of widespread falsehood. Two, courage to say no to everyone in the family or at work when our faith values are threatened. Three, courage to go eat alone and endure suffering when it becomes necessary. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you, we glorify your holy name for your many blessings. Thank you for giving us the examples of the prophets today, particularly prophet Jeremiah. Thank you for giving us the example of Jesus. Jesus who has come to kindle fire on it. And he says, how I wish it was flaming already. Lord, kindle the fire of your love in our hearts. Kindle zeal and enthusiasm for your house in our hearts. Let the fire of the Holy Spirit burn within us. Let that fire be our source of courage. Let that fire be our source of commitment as we strive to serve you. We are struggling to live the Christian life in a rotten, corrupt, indisciplined, unjust society. Lord, show us clearly what our prophetic role in these circumstances are. Make us agents of transformation in our society. Help us that the gospel we have received may not lose its transforming power in our society. That our salt may not lose its taste. That our light will shine to the glory of God in heaven. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord.